Well Together podcast. Welcome to Well Together podcast. In each episode, inspiring conversations from wellness experts will guide you towards a better life. If you are ready, let's start our healthy life journey. In this episode, we are truly excited to introduce you to an extraordinary guest. Our host, Michelle Schoenfeld, welcomes Ben Lucas, a conventionally successful Goldman Sachs lawyer who gave it all up to embark on a spiritual conquest and become a Zen Jedi guru, Kung Fu monk with key superpowers. Immersing in meditative martial arts while coaching online from Songshan Mountain, China, the birthplace of Zen. Nothing more to say, but to delve into this stimulating conversation. The journey to well-being together begins now. Hello and welcome to the Well Together podcast. I'm your host and well-being alchemist, Michelle Schoenfeld, and I am thrilled to share another wonderful story with you here today that you are sure to love. Today, I am interviewing Ben Lucas, and he's going to talk to us about his radical story of transformation how he swapped being a corporate lawyer at Goldman Sachs for the Shaolin Temple in China and how meditation and so many things have changed his life and how he is going around the world now hosting retreats and sharing what he has learned with other people to help them live their best life. So before I go any further, let me welcome to the show, Ben Lucas. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. So what led you to make such a drastic shift from a successful corporate lawyer to practicing meditation in China. How did that happen? Yeah, I, um, I've had many inspirational teachers along my way, but I think the best were my chronic pain, uh, addictive habits or wild hedonism, and then also the stress and burnout, which I was experiencing, especially when I was at law school, and my life was just very crazy, you know? At that point, I spent uh, four months traveling for the first time in my life. And I realized when I was journaling, oh God, this lifestyle which I'm leading, I don't like it as much as I'm pretending. So I spent six weeks on a martial arts camp, two weeks in a silent meditation retreat, yoga and all sorts of things. And then I came back to myself and something erupted from the inside, something awakened, which was infinitely more beautiful than any of the ephemeral highs which I had experienced in my normal go get them lifestyle, you know, and that inspired uh, things to change. This was actually before I started working as a lawyer, but the seed had been planted. Um, I couldn't forget this, you know, and I vowed to myself that I would never let this, this, this spark, this feeling of awakeness, which I realized had been gone for some time as I was asleep to. So then as fate would have it, it seemed my karma was that I was to attempt to grow this within the corporate dojo, so to speak, well, as a lawyer. So I was working as a lawyer while trying to integrate the practice into my daily life so that I didn't get overwhelmed by it all. And then uh, I was sort of gradually plotting my escape, you could say. I knew that I would be moving in this direction generally. And it was after about six or seven years of this that I, you could say, yeah, finally broke uh, free. I say broke free as if the corporate world is evil. I really don't think this at all. I think there's a lot to be said about, um, you know, practicing within the corporate dojo, I call it. Well, it's true because we're kind of raised, at least in a lot in Western society, of going for the brass ring. Like success, success, money, things, house, clothes. Like, And to do that, you have to be working hard. And we kind of forget sometimes that balance is really what it's all about, right? It's being in balance. So do you feel like maybe because you were doing all this corporate lawyer, Goldman Sachs, the people that you were around, you just kind of like lost sight of, of what you had learned earlier? It was, it was interesting because like the spark, I had already seen how insane this world was before I had even started at Goldman Sachs, but I was already in the loop of, you know, high performing academic sports and so on. Uh, at law school but then when I went into Goldman Sachs and I was I felt like I was almost like a spy on an undercover mission you know to try to grow this inner stillness and clarity and balance while amidst all this insanity and the more I was able to retain my center amidst this insanity the more I was became sensitized to this 
and the more compassion I felt for all of the pain that's going on in that world, you know? And I guess the core shifts that went on in me is that I realized by implementing and holding this center and this place of balance and peace within, I was not only able to be more at peace with myself, but much more effective at what I could do. And then I could see that a lot of the stress which was going on around outside me in the world was actually unnecessary. How did your practice of internal martial arts and meditation help you with the challenges you faced making this transition? Okay, so this is a really, really important point. So with the Shaolin Chinese martial arts practices, meditative arts that I have learned, we have yin and yang practice. So yin being soft, internal, uh, quiet meditation, soft tai chi, and yang have the hard kung fu training. So Shaolin monks, for example, are famous for, you know, breaking bricks with their hands and all of this kind of thing. Wow. And I feel like we need both. We need the stillness to be able to calm ourselves down and to make decisions and to come back to ourselves. But then we also need some of the yang energy, this decisiveness, this clarity to not be bullied, not be victimized, to be able to be in the world. And a lot of the time people move too much in one direction or the other. They meditate a lot, but they can't be in the world or they're doing too much hardcore exercise, but they can't slow down. So for me, growing both at the same time enabled me to be in both worlds. It's interesting. I think a lot of people can probably relate to that. It is hard to bring the balance. We think, oh, we're just going to be peaceful or we just have to go, go, go. Yeah. You know, it's interesting how you put it, of bringing those both together to find that balance. What is the core discovery you made from your journey that you feel the world would benefit from most <laughs> yeah people think spirituality is just about being peaceful calm yes this is a component but really for example buddha means the awakened one what does this mean and so a lot of people they think oh, okay i just need to be calm but actually for me spirituality is about waking up and taking responsibility for our lives and seeing actually we create this whole thing anything is possible that this life is incredibly precious that we have and why would I not do everything that I can to maximize this precious opportunity so to view spirituality as not something superstitious or something that's too much about comforting yourself but a way of living more vividly that makes sense like so not so much the rules of other people but what works for you to live Right, and this is also why I like to I like to speak and where where I teach I like to use my own language and non like hippie or spiritual language as well, which I think can put a lot of people off as well. It's so true. I think if we taught what you just said to children, if it was like mandatory to teach that to children, like kindergarten, preschool, first grade, we could change the world in like one generation. <laughs> it's like so true. If we taught this to kids, like why'd we have to wait till we're adults to like wake up to this sometimes? Yeah. Can you share a particularly memorable moment or breakthrough from one of the meditation retreats that you've experienced? I mentioned before that I had chronic pain for many years. This is really bad, actually. Um, it's a big fuel for everything I've done. I broke my jaw playing rugby and I had lots of tension. And whenever I'd meditate, I'd be trying to fidget around and bah, I couldn't do it. And then I went on a retreat. And that was happening. And then also from sitting 10 hours a day, my knees were killing me. And I spoke to the teacher and I was like, I'm dying. I feel like my knees about to burst. Like, what do I do? And she said, Ben, in my experience, the only people who have ever injured themselves in meditating, the people who fight it. Next day, I went back to the cushion. Again, the pain comes. Oh my God. And I'm like, I'm trying to let go, but ah, ah. <laughs> and then at one moment, it's like, I just gave up. It, I burst. I gave up and in that moment, ah, the pain just disappeared. And then that realization, that experiential deep realization that in the process of letting go and truly giving up and allowing myself to deflate, then all the problem or the, the suffering goes away. That inspired not just my relationship with pain to completely change, but my relationship to everything with life. I love how you just said give up and then transition that exact feeling into letting go. And sometimes I feel like we think we're giving up when really what we're doing is letting go of the resistance mm. and giving in, maybe. Mm. I like that you said that. That's really good. It's so important to let go. 
Uh, that was a beautiful correlation. Well Together Podcast. Dear listener, if you're considering joining us for a mental wellness retreat at the Life Co. Centres, we have an exciting surprise for you. Visit thelifeco.com to discover more about what awaits you. Let me ask you, because you brought up the rugby, and I know you're an elite athlete, how did your elite level sports background influence your approach to meditation and stress management? <laughs> I love when like, especially men, to be honest, are so like, go get it careers and athletes yeah. and probably a little type A, and then they find this beautiful kind of awakening and balance. When I first moved into the world of meditation and so on, I thought all of my competitive nature, sports, everything, this is bad and evil and anti-spiritual and I just need to give up any drive and all masculinity is evil. <laughs> you know? um, I've found in the world of Shaolin, for example, that when that drive, and this is actually a really important discovery I've made for myself and I like to transmit to people who have that fire, that drive inside them, is that when it is directed in a, in a positive way, it can be extremely beneficial. The level of like organization, dedication that I put to my practice and the, able, the level of consistency that I've been able to um, retain in how, keeping like a five hour daily practice, waking up at the right time and doing all of these kind of things. This has been amazing for me, completely life changing. For me, self-acceptance can be to accept that there is this drive, but I just need to know how to, to funnel it, you know? I like that. I took my deep dive about 12 years ago and into meditation and became a therapist and did all this for quite a long time, I went a little too hippie, which wasn't my nature. Yeah. I like I was not in balance. And then somewhere along the line, I kind of brought myself back to little clearings. And so I love that you said like how important the balance part of it is too. Yeah. You know, you can still be <laughs> masculine and all this stuff and have a beautiful meditation practice. Well, what role does the community play in your personal meditation practice and teaching? I maybe take back a little bit of what I said before. This is an area <laughs> where my masculine masculine traits was not helpful. Because for <laughs> many years, I was like, no, I'm going to do this solo. I don't need a teacher. I don't need any support. And I realized a lot of the time that I was just going around in circles in my own blind spots, you know. And it was then when finding, um, in particular, there was one Shaolin master who completely changed my life. And then the community around him, my practice and everything just exploded from there. Now, I'm relative to, to the normal person, fairly advanced in this kind of thing, but I always, I always have at least two or three mentors at any given time. You know, for example, Michael Jordan had nine coaches. This idea that we have <laughs> in our heads that like reaching out to people for support is a sign of weakness is absurd, you know. It's very important for me to create my own coaching programs when I'm doing retreats and so on is this group of band of like brothers and sisters going in a journey you know because we are as the cliche goes we are the average of the people the five people we spend most time around you know so this is totally central in a world where most people have people who are pulling them into the less healthy kind of stuff it's so true and i'm glad you shared that it's kind of like vulnerable statements because we're evolving so like you are evolving through your practice learning what works and what doesn't work i love that you're sharing that thank you What advice would you have for people who feel that they're too busy to practice meditation? I'm sure you were one of those people, yeah. or at least you were around those people at one point in your life. Yeah. And what would you say to them? <laughs> I realized this is obviously a key question to my coaching, because I'm coaching a lot of people, busy people, you know. For me to demonstrate to them and to show them that actually slowing down will help them to speed up. So busy people, they think I'm too busy for practice because I need to do things because I need to get some things done. But actually, a lot of the time, your nervous system is in such a hyper state that you're just attending to all these trivial, superficial things and you're checking social media and you're distracted all the <laughs> time. And you're unable to do the deep, important task or have any clarity or oversight of your life to actually sink down into this place where you can realize, okay, this is what I have to do. This is what I don't have to do. This is what my job done for today looks like, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, you know. 
For me, for example, I was able to reduce my workday at Goldman Sachs to like two hours per day while growing my daily practice to three, four hours per day. And this is a key thing where my students are like, what? Uh, because <laughs> I thought meditation is supposed to be some like distraction from work, you know. So I like to demonstrate to the people that by deepening your practice, slowing down and then using a bunch of other techniques I use, which can be encompassed under the bread of something like Zen, a Zen approach to business, being able to be more effective by doing less. This can start to shift something in people's minds. Well, there's the old classic Zen saying or Zen story where someone asks the teacher, you know, master, how long should I meditate? And they say half an hour. And they say, what if I don't have half an hour to meditate? And they say, you know, you should practice for one hour. I, I love that. I've heard that. I love yeah, that. It's so it's true. It's a classic cliche, but it's a good one. <laughs> it, it kind of reminds me, my dad was a big corporate guy. and But one thing he taught me early, which I really liked in my corporate career, was to work smart versus working hard. And I always liked that. It was like, how can you use your time best? I might have worked less hours, but I got a lot more done than a lot of people, my contemporaries running around. And I feel like that's kind of what you're saying with this is that if you can add some meditation, even if it's start with five minutes, right? Even whatever it is, I'm guessing, just start with something. Yeah. But if you have a proper practice, then you're not gonna feel so stressed. You're not gonna feel like you don't have time because we always have time. We always, there's always time. <laughs> So I'm going to bring you back to like, if you can give a, a tip, like just somebody who says, okay, I'm too busy. Yeah. What can they do to start? Okay. Just to start carving out time. The way for me, I do it in a systematic way. I say it starts at the start of your day. Like the first 20 minutes sets the tone for your day. And you can always find 10 minutes at the start of your day. Even if that means waking up 10 minutes early, go to bed 10 minutes early and so on. When I'm coaching, the golden rule is that you don't check your phone or any inbox. You don't open Pandora's inbox and open this land of busyness until you've finished like a, a grounding morning practice. And then you make that a non-negotiable in your day every day. And then you can start slowly but surely grow it from there. But it's about starting on the front foot. You don't start your day in reactivity mode because then that sets the tone for the rest of the day and then you're gone. And that's so true. Yeah. I like that. Set the tone for the day. Just take that 10 minutes, that five minutes, and then grow it. So what advice would you give to somebody who feels overwhelmed by the idea? Like, I just can't start 20 minutes twice a day. I just can't do it. Yeah. Like, just to get started. Maybe they don't even understand what meditation actually is because they've only seen, like, the traditional, like, transcendental, or they've only seen it in a movie. Two things. One seek guidance from someone who knows what they're doing you really respect and you look at them and think, yeah this person has a quality which i would like to uh, would like to feel because if you're doing it by yourself honestly i don't think very stressed overwhelmed people tend to get very far just by trying to start a 10 minute habit on an app i think you need something a bit more robust than that if you can be brave enough to take yourself somewhere like life go or on a meditation retreat then that can change your life entirely. I found many people, they will be playing around with these meditation apps for many years. And in five years, they wouldn't get as far as they would on just a one week meditation retreat, which could then completely change their lives. The second one is that I view meditation as the simplest, but also the most advanced practice in the sense that many people, because of all of the stress and all of the stagnation in their body, when they sit to meditate, they are basically sitting around in their own mess. And this is where Qigong Tai Chi Kung Fu practice comes in. It is resolving this internal mess so that when you come to sit down, it's already there. So I'd, I'd advise to do something with your body, which is an, like a non-aggressive movement modality. And this is where I find Qigong Tai Chi perfect. But of course, yoga can be good as well, that, that you actually enjoy as well. It feels good because I think a lot of people try to suffer too much through meditation. And you teach both of those, correct? Yes, yeah. I teach a whole sort of Chinese martial arts and meditative practices like a, a complete system. You might say Qigong, Tai Chi, Kung Fu, meditation. All go together. Okay, so with that, how important is the concept of letting go in your practice? And how can it be applied to everyday life? And is this kind of physical meditation, does that help with the letting go? 
or is it purely mental? This is absolutely central. So before being a rugby player, bodybuilder and so on, this is all about not letting go. This is all about <laughs> turning on, switching on, being switched, you know, the whole time. These were my role models, the big puffed up guys, you know, and then I found some martial arts masters who I could just sense energetically. I was like, well, these guys are on a different planet, but they're so relaxed. So we have concepts of yin and yang, and there's another concept which is critical to my work called true yang energy. So developing this positive side of this decisive energy. And this true yang energy is something which comes out of stillness, out of relaxation. So a punch is actually at its most effective when it comes from total relaxation first and it explodes. And then through seeing that in my own body and practice, I said, to, oh, this is a principle which can be applied to everything in life. It's like the energy to make a decision to, to create anything in life is so much more pure when it comes from relaxation first and then suddenly there's a spark and you have this natural energy come through. In Taoism, we have the concept of Wu Wei or effortless action. And of course, yeah, Tai Chi, Qigong, Kung Fu, all of this, learning to soften the body so you can give rise to this true Yang energy is what it's all about. I love that. I've tried a little Qigong and Tai Chi and I really like them. I really do. I actually prefer it over yoga. Um, and lastly, for those listening who may feel stuck in their current circumstances, because it is a busy world, we know, especially right now with everything going on. What advice would you give to them to start finding their own purpose and passion? If you really feel stuck, really, and, and life means something to you, you know, then in my opinion, just trying to do a little bit here and there in your busy life, you're not really going to find that deep sense of stillness. I recommend finding a way of spending good extended time in stillness, somewhere healthy, go to uh, silent retreat somewhere like Life Co. Spent day in nature without your phone. Just whew, come back to yourself. Your purpose, passion, is not something which you are going to get by running faster. This is already inside you. There is a spark inside you. All you need to do is put yourself in a safe space where all of this noise can fall away. And then it will naturally arise like the two true yang energy we talked about before and come from within i love that tying it back to what you said about starting your day with a little meditation even if it's short i think it's such a great way because it puts you in that energetic field to receive a little bit right it starts you like at a higher kind of like brain just better i think that more um maybe you're able to receive more messages of what your true passion is or what makes you happy i love that Actually, on the, the last note, just uh, if you're feeling stuck, is don't blame your environment. Take responsibility for your own life. Wake up. Have this moment of, yes, okay, I am responsible for this. My entire life, I'm going to unstuck myself. That is beautiful. That, I think, is a perfect place to end this episode of the Well Together podcast. That was beautiful, Ben. Thank you. And thank you, like Ben Lucas, everybody. Thank you for joining us mm -hmm. and sharing such a wonderful topic with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. It's been fun. Until next time, everyone, I'm Michelle Schoenfeld, and you've been listening to Well Together Podcast. Inspiring stories from the Life Co. Let's meet Tenzin Josh, a mental health expert and former student of the Dalai Lama. He gives valuable insights on how to change our mental habits. We talk about habits on three different levels. There's physical habits, verbal habits, and mental habits. But the most important level of habits is mental habits. Why is that? Because if we look at the physical habits and we look at the verbal habits, and we ask where they're coming from, they're all originating from mental habits. So the most important level to change habits or work with habits is on the mental level. Habit is always the, a negative habit at least, is always the, the unskillful way. It's the reaction way. It's one you've built up over many times of doing it again and again. Our only way to change that habit, to start to react in a different way, or to change the habits into more positive ones, is to give yourself the mental space to change your intention. So change the intentions in your life. Intention in general is so important. 
When you get up in the morning, your intention for the day, is my intention just to have a holiday or is my intention to just to eat or is my intention just to drink or is my intention to do something meaningful? Or is it to, to learn something or to help somebody or to make a change in the world? The result of your intention comes about from that basic intention. Very classic example, you can do a five minutes meditation. If you do that meditation with the intention of feeling relaxed at the end of it, you'll be relaxed for five minutes at the end of it. But that's it, it's finished. But if you do the same five minutes meditation with the thought that through this meditation, my mind will get better and I'll be able to work with my habits and, and change my habits, then it'll work as long as you need to change your habits, which might be your whole life. Or if you do the same five minutes meditation, but you do it with the intention of being improving yourself to help every other living being, which is an enormous intention, because there's limitless numbers of, of living beings, then of course your intention never finishes. The results of your intention never finish until you've helped everybody. So the intention in your mind determines the way you habitually live your life. So the real source or the real root of changing your habits is to change your intentions. Make your intentions more positive, and then what follows on from those intentions becomes more positive as well. Well Together Podcast. Are you ready to create the best version of yourself? Your transformation journey starts at the Life Co. With over 18 years of experience, the LifeCo Wellbeing is committed to helping you achieve optimal health and well-being with a unique range of programs and retreats. Holistic well-being experiences that promote longevity and meaning in your life await you at the LifeCo Centers in Bodrum, Antalya, and Phuket. Visit thelifeco.com today to start your wellness journey. Thank you for listening Well Together podcast.